Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture, we looked at grounding and isolation practices. In this lecture, we'll look at some bad grounding and isolation practices in that they largely do not exist in these examples. The All-American Five is a nickname given to a particularly popular radio design, and it was popular because it was cheap. Any design exercise involves various trade-offs, and one of those trade-offs is cost versus safety. And this is a design that pretty much emphasized low costs at the expense of safety. It got its name All-American 5 from the five tubes that were part of the design. And you could think of these like an earlier version of a modern chipset. So when Intel or AMD makes a chip, they also make a set of chips that go along with it to support various functions. And these are all designed to work together. These tubes were all designed to work together. One thing to note going forward is that these were usually housed in this nice bake light case but there might be screws used to affix the chassis to the case, and those screws might protrude from the case and come into contact with the user. Digging a bit deeper into the design, we see that the power is hooked directly to the filaments as if these things were just light bulbs. Well, tubes are basically light bulbs, but usually you want to have some sort of isolation transformer in here in general because you want your wall current to be isolated from the rest of your circuitry and connected only through the magnetic field of the transformer. As an aside, notice that there's an AC-DC label over here. These radios were generally designed to work off of wall current or batteries. Because remember, this came out at a time when big portions of many countries were not electrified. Most tube designs you'll see nowadays, for instance in guitar amplifiers, will have the filaments wired in parallel. Here the filaments are wired in series. And this explains why we have such strange voltage requirements on the filaments of the tubes. So most tubes nowadays you'll see will have 6 volts or 12 volts. Technically it's something like 6.3 or 12.6 volts. And that 6.3 and 12.6 actually came from the fact that batteries were available in a standard 2.1 volt configuration. And let's see, let's add up the filament voltages. I have three 12 volts, so that's 36. And if I add 50 to it, that's then 86. And if I add 35 to that, that's 121. So close enough. The main thing to note here is that there's no polarization indication on the input here. And there's no indication of a ground pin on your power connector because this was made at a time where there was no ground pin on most power connectors. And in particular, there wasn't any indication of polarization on the wall socket. This was even before you had one side of the wall socket have a slot that's longer than the other to indicate what's the hot and what's the neutral. And in any case, it was usually just kind of wired randomly. So... If you just flip a coin to figure out which way to plug in this radio, there's a 50% chance that the hot is hooked to the chassis. So if there's a screw protruding from this case or some other bit of metal somehow, and you come into contact with that hot chassis, you have now been invited to experience 120 volts AC, just as if you had stuck your finger into the wall socket. So we have an incredibly hazardous device all to save the cost of a power transformer. Oh, and while we're talking about cost savings, notice there's only one diode tube here. So this is a half-wave rectifier. So half of the power is basically getting thrown away, but the name of the game here was to try to build this cheaply. Notice something else about this. They put the switch on the chassis side. So even if you plug this in quote-unquote properly and have the hot at the top up here and the neutral at the bottom, well, the chassis is still hooked to the hot even when it's switched off. All you have is the resistance of the filaments here to protect you, and that's not enough. This can still kill you even when it's switched off. If you run across one of these radios and want to use it, I recommend checking out this antiqueradio.org website. This is Phil's old radios, mm -hmm. and he has a web page specifically on improving the safety and reliability of these kinds of circuits. Mm -hmm.
Notice that just installing a polarized plug here isn't going to help you because, as I mentioned before, this is dangerous in one way or another, however you plug it in. And also, you should never assume that the people who wired a building wired the hot and neutral correctly. There's all kinds of horror stories that you can hear from any electrician about places that were wired incorrectly. At least with these radios, there was a general design principle to prevent the user from coming into contact with the chassis. But there were actually guitar amplifiers designed using these All-American 5 design principles. Like this Magnetone 107 amplifier. So it's particularly problematic with guitars because on an electric guitar, the bridge is usually grounded and the strings that are conductive are connected to the bridge. So the strings are grounded and they do this in order to try to reduce interference. So if you have this plugged in properly, the hot is connected to the rectifier, the neutral is connected to the chassis through this 270K resistor, but you still have a safety hazard because if a hot wire comes loose and touches the chassis, well then that full voltage is applied to the guitar player. Now, assuming for a moment that no wires have come loose, if you plug this in the wrong way, it's not an instantaneous complete disaster because the hot is connected through the chassis through this 270K current limiting resistor. But between that and whatever AC manages to leak through this capacitor here that's there to reduce interference, this can still give you a tingle tangle. Now an extra problem arises if you have this hooked up the wrong way and this capacitor has started to go bad in such a way that it's starting to pass more current, especially if this thing fails as a short. Now you're in a situation where you're having the full hot applied to the chassis and hence the full hot applied to the guitar strings. So these kinds of capacitors have gotten the nickname death capacitor. And these sorts of amplifiers as a whole have gotten the nickname Widowmakers. Now these so-called death capacitors can be problematic even in amplifiers that do use a transformer. So here we have an early Fender Champ amplifier. Notice here we have two plates in this rectifier symbol, so this is now using full wave rectification. And if you have it plugged in properly, there's no problem. And people would tend to be inclined to want to plug it in properly because if you did, then the capacitor would do a better job at reducing radio frequency interference and other electromagnetic gremlins. And if you had it plugged in the wrong way, there would be enough current flowing through this capacitor here to give you a tingle tangle. So it might not kill you, it might not even hurt per se, but it is sure going to surprise you. And I can tell you that from experience. And if this capacitor were to fail as a short, well, now if you have it plugged in the wrong way, you have this full hot applied to the chassis and hence applied to the guitar strings, hence the nickname death capacitor. Now you may be tempted to solve the problem by just cutting out this death capacitor and letting the chassis float relative to the mains, but you don't really want to do that because now you don't have that interference protection. And also the amp is still dangerous because there's no ground safety wire. A hot wire could come loose, touch the chassis and zap you. Here's one of the iterations of the Fender Deluxe. And here they conveniently supply a switch for you to decide which of the pins of the two pin plug you want to hook to the chassis through your death capacitor. So this saves you the trouble of having to actually switch the cord around at the wall socket. So you would typically switch this to the setting that gave you the least noise and or the least tingle tangle. This is still not a great idea. Now, if you were in some application where this capacitor was really essential, well, you could say, let's replace it with a modern class Y safety capacitor. But here, nah, just go ahead and cut this cap and then install a proper three-wire plug and ground the chassis properly. The annotated schematics I've shown you are from this excellent website by Rob Robinette that includes all sorts of information about tube amplifiers, including information about Widowmaker amplifiers with advice on how to make them more safe and how to work on them safely in general.
And even if you aren't dealing with a Widowmaker amp, it's a good idea to learn about death capacitors because they show up in a lot of non-Widowmaker designs. And in general, I recommend that everybody check out Rob's page on tube amplifier safety. Much of the advice here is relevant to high voltage safety in general, even for applications beyond tube amplifiers. And if you are interested in guitar amplifiers, I would highly recommend just deep diving into his webpage in general. Like here's an analysis of Marshall amplifiers. How cool is that? So go check it out.